I live near a very large, very popular national park. Locals here, like myself, are pretty aware of the goings-on near here. Strange sounds, strange creatures, and strange disappearances. I have dealt with these myself in the past on hikes and even just relaxing in the park. Here's one that still freaks me out to this day. I was at my grandma's house that's deep in the boonies. The only road there is a gravel road that is pretty much washed away, so without a good car, you're not getting out there anyways. My cousins lived in a trailer with their mom right below my grandma's. We played all sorts of games which mainly involved me getting chased, since I was the youngest. My grandma was in the hospital with my aunt, so our older cousin, who I'll name Dee, had to watch us. Dee was, and still is, the only cousin that's older than us that we still hold in high regards. He would mess with us and play around, but actually cared about us. The whole day we spent playing around, but we would usually play more at night, like hide and seek and tag, etc. We had been playing pretty far away from the house, and it was starting to get dark. We decided to go back to the house and grab flashlights and play manhunt. Of course, I was the one being hunted again. I ran pretty far into the woods on the other side of the property and hid behind a log. I heard my cousins getting close so I ran and they saw me. We ended up running to the very back of the property, almost a mile from the house and we saw my cousin D. He looked at us and kind of growled and we all ran from him thinking it was a game. We ran back onto the gravel road and we saw him walk out of the tree line but he did it in a sort of weird kind of gloatingly kind of way. We ran into the house and decided to barricade the door to play a prank on him. We moved a couple of things in front of the door but decided to move the big coffee table in front of it too. As we loudly scooted the table across the floor, Dee came into the living room from the master bedroom rubbing his eyes. We'd obviously woke him from all the movement and he was mad. We told him about seeing him chase us and he got wide-eyed. He told us to go to our bedroom and stay there. We sat in the bedroom for about 20 minutes and he came in and told us not to worry, that it was just him scaring us and we went on with the night. It wasn't until about three years later when I was 13 that he told me the truth. It was a skinwalker. He told me that he had dealt with it when he was our age and told me his story. And this is how it went. This happened around the mid-90s. D, much like me and my cousin, spent his childhood around my mama's property with his brother C and his cousin K. They would play manhunt and tag and such like we did. When this story took place, it was in the middle of the summer and he was around 12. He and C and K were playing at a treehouse that is no longer standing. They had just pulled a prank on K and were hiding from him in the treehouse. D and C stayed in the treehouse until K stopped looking. C left and went back to our mama's house and left D alone. D stayed up in the treehouse and read some comics. The treehouse was about a half a mile from the house and was on a hill so that you could still see the house from it, but it was still in the woods. At the time, my papa was still alive but was in Georgia on a retreat so he was not there, which let the three boys do whatever they wanted. Papa would holler for them to come in when it started to get dark because there was, and still is, a large number of coyotes and bears around the property. Dee decided to read comics all day, something he still enjoys, and eventually fell asleep. He woke up and it was dusk. He heard our mama yelling for him and he began to get ready to leave. As he went down the ladder, he heard a coyote yip and he climbed back up. At this point, he began to get a little upset when telling me this story. He began to explain what the coyote looked like and I realized it was the same one that me and my cousins had seen growing up as well. It looked like it had mange. It had a large tuft of fur missing on its right side and you could see the bare pale skin and it had human-like eyes. It snarled at him and bore its teeth. He was taken aback by this and he just sat back down in the treehouse. The coyote sat at the base of the ladder and just looked up at him. He told me he sat there for about 20 minutes trying to figure out what to do. He remembered he had a slingshot and decided the best course of action would be to try to scare it off with that. 
He said he shot at it and it just growled more. My cousin was and still is a very good shot with a slingshot. I had a couple of bruises to prove it. He reared back and decided to aim at its eye because he didn't like the way it stared at him. He reared back and got it right in its left eye and it ran away yowling. D got a little more emotional now as he told me this. He told me he climbed down the ladder and made a mad dash toward the house. About halfway to the house there is a large dip in the land where there are a bunch of bushes and small trees. When he was about there he told me that he heard coyote yips all around him and swore that a whole pack had come upon him. He just ran from it and while he was on his way up the other side of the dip he tripped and hurt his leg. D started to get upset and had to stop a few times at this point. He told me he got up and started to limp towards the house and this is the part that gave me chills. He told me that he turned and looked behind him and saw not a coyote anymore, but a human person, and it looked like it had a face. He said it started to walk towards him in an odd way, but luckily C and K started yelling for him, and as quickly as it appeared, it disappeared. D told C and K, but they didn't believe him, and they told him it was just a trick of the night something that he still tries to believe in. As soon as he told me this, he kindly asked me not to ask him about it anymore, as when he thinks about it, he thinks he sees that coyote outside. D is a very religious and reliable man, so when he says weird stuff is happening, I usually believe him. The coyote he saw that night, me and my cousins have seen before as well, along with a stag. Since the night me and my cousins saw it, I've had two more encounters, the latest one being last year. I'll also share those in time. One of my cousins who was there with me that night has a reddit and may soon tell his perception of the events. I have some more stories that happened to me in the park than on family land that I'm going to share soon. Several of my friends have had creepy encounters as well and if they're willing I may share theirs as well. I just come to find it so strange that weird things happen out here in these remote areas. I've held on to this story for over a decade and have flirted with posting it here but just kept talking myself out of it. I can't sleep and it all popped in my head again and just don't care and want to share so here it goes. I moved into a recently renovated house with two friends when we were in our 20s. We were each professionals in our respective fields and found this great house at a great price and agreed it made sense to move in together for the year's lease and save up money during that time. Now to make it simple for any mental visual, just know it was a ranch style and there was one hallway with the first bedroom immediately on the left, second on the right near a bathroom and my room at the very end of the hall. That said, let's move on to the things that we all agreed we wouldn't talk about because people would think we're crazy. The first day we moved in, we were going over the random spots around the house. We didn't when we checked it out prior to signing the lease. I was looking at a bookshelf that was built into a wall and noticed that the trim around it was in a way covering something white, red, and blue. I reached in and grabbed a plastic Virgin Mary with water in it and called my buddies over. We look at it and on the bottom was a sticker that said, Holy Water with a local church's name. The three of us laughed at it and after some jokes threw it away and just moved on. Within a few weeks, one of my friends brought up his girlfriend, now wife, moving in with us and we agreed it'd be fine because, hey, more money saved for each of us and we had plenty of space. Right when she moved in, things got weird for each of us. The first weird thing to happen was, I noticed that in every room but my bedroom, and later verified my roommate's rooms, there were piles of swept dust in from each door, kitchen, and living room. I thought it odd, but none of my friends did it, and we all agreed it was odd. Maybe two weeks later, let's say roommate one's wife and I were home and were in our rooms and heard banging coming from the living room and kitchen, and ran out to see what it was. Once we got out halfway and could see the kitchen, our jaws dropped as we found all the cabinets were open. Every cabinet door, top and bottom, open. 
Needless to say, we were all shocked and confused. We closed the cabinets, made coffee, and sat in silence. This became a reoccurring occurrence that everyone experienced over the year. Now being about two months into the lease, I would start waking up in the morning or from naps, gasping for air, and feeling like I had been strangled, which began to terrify me as it continued to happen until I moved out. During that time, with things happening, we were all getting on without any issues. One day, when friend one and his wife had gone out to dinner, I was walking down the hall to my room and heard a woman's laugh come from their room, which immediately made the hair on my neck stand up. I leaned into friend two's room and verified they had left, and he confirmed it, but I still knocked and opened their door to find the room empty. With these things having happened, I began wondering what was going on, but couldn't make heads or tails of it. Moving forward, I had my computer desk directly against the wall where I would sit with my back to the door. I started to hear footsteps coming down the hall behind me almost daily to the point where I both moved my desk and began shutting my door so I wouldn't hear it or get creeped out. Unfortunately, even with the desk moved, if the door was open, I would hear the footsteps. Five months in, I asked my roommates if my girlfriend could move in as well, and again, no resistance from them, so in she came. Right before she moved in, everyone in the house started losing things for lack of a better term. CDs would disappear. TV remotes from bedrooms would go missing and need to be replaced. Even a pair of shoes at one point. This started to make all of us start questioning if someone was stealing, which didn't make the situation better. One night shortly after my girlfriend moved in at around 7pm, with everyone home there was a commotion in the kitchen and glass shattering. We all ran to find that the coffee pot had somehow flown off the coffee maker and smashed on the ground a solid 10 feet from the coffee maker. This was when we all started to get very, very creeped out. Seven months in, friend two's girlfriend moved in and things seemed to go back to normal. I decided with all the previous things having happened, I wanted to find all the lost items and began digging around the house. I was in the garage one day and found a near hidden hatch to what turned out to be a small attic, short in height, that wasn't finished but ran almost the entire length of the house. I grabbed a ladder and climbed up, and had a heck of a time opening the hatch but finally got it open and climbed in. I crawled through and in the very back of the space I found every item that had gone missing. I backed out and got my friends to go in one by one to see what I found as they didn't believe me. Both went in and both came out white as a sheet. I ended up going back up and getting everything that was up there and when I came back down went out to buy a lock and hinge for it just to give myself a false sense of security knowing how hard the hatch had been to open in the first place. Things like the cupboards opening and closing continued and became something we all refused to talk about. We met a neighbor our age one day chatting while grabbing the mail and told him to pop by for a beer when he had a chance as he had grown up literally next door and said he used to mow the lawn for the previous owner as a kid. He came by a few weeks later and when he walked in his first words were, Wow! This place looks completely different. Over a few beers, we asked him what the place used to look like and got some odd responses. He started by saying when he was a kid, mowing the lawn, the owners were in their late 70s and very, very religious. He pointed to one wall and simply said, That wall was literally floor to ceiling, pictures of Jesus, Mary, and crosses. He continued to tell us that they were from somewhere in the Caribbean, possibly Cuban, and would use goat's blood, or at least that's what they said it was, to draw symbols on the windows during specific parts of the year. When I asked why they did, they just said to keep bad spirits out. Bingo. We had found the source of our crazy, but are still very unnerved, as I think anyone would be. There were plenty of other things I wasn't experiencing, but one friend in particular was, he has two brand new TVs, CRT to give an idea of the general time frame. On top of that, he had two freshly built PCs up and die on him, even with pet wiring being brand new, and him having UPS that should have stopped any surges. These are just a few. 
I had a coworker whose wife worked in real estate and for local government who, after hearing the stories I told her husband, got the history of the house. I found out that the, let's call them crazy old owners, bought the house right when it was built and they both died there. After the house was sold, none of the owners after stayed more than two years before selling the house until the then current owner bought it. Interesting, right? To use the phrase again, Shortly after this information got to me, I did something I would never have expected myself to do, which was try to talk to them. Since I got home before the others, I asked the two that had died in the house by name to stop messing with us and that we aren't there to make a mess, nor will we be there much longer. I felt crazy, but when you feel crazy, sometimes you just have to do crazy things. This one-way conversation did nothing. I began waking up in the morning to find things that had been typed, no joke, on my computer while I slept. I asked my girlfriend, who was a very light sleeper, if I had been waking up at night and she gave me a solid no. The typing was gibberish and just added to my already rattled nerves. Around the same time, the same thing happened to one of my friends who then started to get very creeped out himself. One night I got into some ridiculous argument with my girlfriend and she opted to sleep on the couch. After about ten minutes I started hearing scratching going up the wall behind my headboard and I began getting unnerved for the thousandth time when my door opened and in walked my girlfriend, silent, aside from the words move over. The scratching stopped immediately and I asked her why she had came back in. She then said something I couldn't quite understand but was told that while she was on the couch, the two of us being the only ones home with the roommates gone for the weekend, she heard two people talking in the kitchen. I couldn't hear what they were saying, it just sounded like people talking in whispers and gibberish. Fantastic. Now they're talking. Maybe a month later, we are home alone again or on the couch when I turn the TV off as she's asleep and I can tell I'll be there shortly when I hear the voices myself. When I say I was legitimately terrified, it would be an understatement. The voices were clear as crystal, and just as she said, if you've ever watched anything where there are ghosts and they are talking in an odd backwards whisper and an unintelligible gibberish, that's exactly what it sounded like. I looked right where they should be, and nothing. No one there, and they kept talking. This went on for at least ten minutes. I say this because I literally willed myself to sleep. A few days later, there was a heavy snowstorm, and the guy that had a dad garage band across the street was shoveling, and as I had just finished, I decided to ask him if he wanted a hand, and he said yes. We began chatting, and I asked if he knew anything about our house. He then started to tell me things that explained more than enough to get me to talk to my girlfriend and then my roommates, letting them know we'd be moving out early. He said that the room at the end of the house, my room, was where the old man died. He had emphysema and COPD and would sit in an armchair in the room and smoke. One day he was doing just that and began to cough and couldn't stop. After a short time he ended up basically choking to death in his chair and his wife was shopping at the time to come home and find him dead. A few years later the old woman was in the room I had previously heard laughing coming from which was apparently her knitting and sewing room where she ended up sitting in a rocking chair when she needed to rest and fell asleep and didn't wake up. I'm sure I've forgotten a lot and this has been long-winded and possibly boring to most of you but I've only shared this with a few friends and wanted to write it out for some reason. I have experienced things throughout my life ever since I was a child. I think I'm sensitive to these things. However, here are just a few stories out of all that have left me terrified, and I'm also curious about yours. Number 1. Me and my mom moved to a flat an old lady had died there before us. My mom cleaned up the place and we moved in. No offense, but it was a typical elderly house, and the thing is all her stuff was left there so we moved into her setup. 
The rug, tables, beds, personal paintings, etc. all stayed. One night I slept in my room, the smaller one. I had a terrible nightmare about the man in the painting in my room. Everything hand-painted and personal, probably someone close to the lady. As I had this nightmare, I sat up straight in a cold sweat, and as I did, the painting fell from the wall and the glass in the frame broke, causing a huge noise. I started crying like there was no tomorrow and refused to sleep or spend time in that room from that day on. I started to live in the living room. Every other part of the house had a really eerie dark vibe to it. So as I live there now, in the living room, me and my mother watch TV, but then she decides to go sleep because she was tired. I say goodnight and she goes. I stay up and continue to watch TV. Now this living room had a kind of door that's glass, but not clear, it's kind of like a blurred mosaic. I'm sure you know what I mean, I just don't have the word for it. Hours pass, and I see my mom through the door messing with the hanger in front of the living room door. I figured she woke up and probably was just looking for something. It got a little weird because she's been standing there for two minutes now. Note that at this point it didn't hit me. She wore one of those green tees they use at work and as I was about to walk over and ask if everything's fine because I thought she felt sick or something, she just went back to bed in my room that I had the nightmare in. I didn't think too much of it until morning. As we had our coffee in the kitchen, I mentioned the night before and she just looked at me, pale. My mom said, Yesterday after I fell asleep, I didn't get up. I slept through the night. And I definitely didn't wear that green shirt, I wore a pink one. Needless to say, my blood turned into ice. Number two. It was a class trip in high school. We went to a small lake and had a little party the first night. At the time, I was having problems with one of my classmates. I had a huge crush on him, and it wasn't mutual, so I wanted to get away from the crowd a bit. Yes, I did drink some, but just really lightly since I never loved alcohol too much and I just hate the taste of it. You could walk around the whole lake, but that required you to approach it from another guest residency because the path was cut into three parts to separate them. Let me explain. The apartment we rented only had one third of this path because... That was the one it owned. At the end, a really deep, around two to three meter pit, and on the other side of that, a fence. So as I walk, I see one of my classmates, Lily, standing at the end of the path facing the pit. She wears white and just stands there. As I get really close, like 30 meters away, she suddenly flips around, looks at me with a horrifying appearance that burned in my mind and jumped into the pit facing me. I ran there in horror but couldn't see anything. I started screaming out of my mind and started running back to get help. Two of my classmates saw that and as I started to tell them what's going on, they got a hold of me and started dragging me back towards the house. As I told them I wanted to run back there so we could help but they held me. At this point I was screaming and crying at the top of my lungs and thinking why won't they understand that we need help. I saw her jump. It really was a scene. Next thing I know, they're telling me, What are you talking about? Lily's back there drinking and she wears red. I honestly didn't see this faint figure or anything ghostly. It legitimately looked like a whole person. Flesh and blood had thrust themselves into the pit. My daughter was seven years old when she discovered her uncle on the living room sofa, dead from a drug overdose. The death was ruled that he ended his own life, but there's still a lot of questions that will never be answered. He was 27, in perfect health, showed no warning signs, but most of all, none of us believe that he would ever do such a thing if there was the slightest chance his niece would discover him. He adored her from the moment she was born, and I can't imagine he would ever want to cause her such emotional trauma. There are a lot of circumstances that point to the fact that he didn't end his life, but that someone else would be happy to have him out of the way. We suspect one person in particular, but this isn't the place to discuss that, especially with no proof. 
Anyone wanting more details of this, feel free to message me, but again, this isn't the place for further discussion on that matter. On the night following his funeral, which wasn't held for ten days after his death because they took so long on the autopsy, my daughter woke in the middle of the night and told me Uncle Dusty was in her room and wanted to talk to me. I followed her across the hall to find an empty room lit only by her Tinkerbell nightlight. She wasn't a bit frightened and was more puzzled that he was nowhere in sight and claimed that he came out of her closet, that the door opening was what woke her up. The closet door was still open, as a matter of fact. She said that he kept pointing towards his temple, then pointing across the hall to the room, which is why she assumed he wanted her to go get me. But the oddest thing was that she said he was talking the entire time, but she couldn't hear a word he was saying. His mouth was moving like he was speaking quickly, but she heard nothing. I dismissed it as a little girl's bad dream after such a terrible experience, especially seeing as how we had buried him that very day. It was bound to be on her mind. Heck, an adult would have a hard time coping, much less a little girl. Fast forward a couple of weeks and I was heading to the kitchen around 1 to 2 a.m. for a glass of water. I drink my water and walk down the hall to return to bed and as I passed her room opposite mine, I glanced in out of habit and froze in my tracks. I saw Uncle Dusty standing at her bedside. I was wide awake and knew what I was seeing. I saw him in detailed profile right down to the baseball cap he always wore. He was standing with one hand on his heart and the other on her forehead while she was sound asleep. Here's what was so strange though and I never heard of anyone experiencing such a thing. He seemed to be made of swirling glitter. He was emitting his own light and his entire body was shimmering. I was stunned and as I stood there he never moved, never looked at me or acknowledged me in any way. I backed away after a few minutes and went back to my own bed. It might sound silly to some but I kind of felt I was intruding on a private moment with his beloved niece. No other major events occurred until nine years later when my daughter, then 16, was diagnosed with a large tumor that had already taken over much of her liver. Of course, it had to be removed immediately, so after she was recovering from an emergency six-hour surgery at her local children's hospital, I took a walk a few blocks away from the hospital property to smoke a cigarette, because as we all know, smoking near a hospital was a no-no. It was quite late at night in a fairly large city, so I was a bit apprehensive being out alone, seeing as how I'm a small female and an easy target for anyone looking to cause trouble. I'm sitting on a bench puffing away, and I see a tall, thin man wearing a baseball cap standing motionless across the street, just watching me. His face was in shadows, so I couldn't see him clearly, but oddly enough, I felt no sense of menace. I finish my smoke and begin walking back and he falls into step behind me, keeping far enough away that I still can't make out his features. As I reach the entrance to the hospital, I look back and he's gone, nowhere to be seen. He couldn't have disappeared that quickly. Upon reaching my daughter's room, the first thing she said when she awoke was that Uncle Dusty came to see her in her dream. Then it struck me that maybe... Just maybe he was watching over me as I took my midnight stroll to make sure no harm came to me, alone at night in the middle of the city. Now the latest visit also comes at a special time. My daughter is now expecting her own baby. She called me this morning in tears and said that she was in the bathroom doing her usual business of washing her face, brushing her teeth, and so on, and said that as she straightened up from the sink, she saw behind her in the mirror her Uncle Dusty just for a split second over her shoulder. She said he was smiling from ear to ear, but by the time she spun around, he was gone. This last experience happened just this morning, so I decided to post about it. A happy experience with a lost loved one is such a boost to any day. In 2017, my family moved to an older house. It was in rough shape, but the landlord promised to fix it up. 
We didn't have a lot of money and it was in our budget so we took it out of desperation. The house sat on a hill by itself fenced in with a huge hill and clubhouse. Each room only had one or two wall lights and none from the ceiling. Strange things started happening shortly after we moved in. First, my kids discovered multiple angel figurines in a circle inside the clubhouse. It was odd, but I chalked it up to the previous tenant's kids doing weird stuff. The basement to the house was weird. We had to walk around the outside of the house along the side porch to a small door. It led to the basement. The basement was basically like someone had dug underneath the house and had no floors or lights. Just a person-sized space where you could walk around about a hundred feet in front and that's it. When my teenage daughter and myself went to have a look inside, there was old funeral flowers and arrangements. Shortly after moving in, a heaviness set in. The air was always heavy and filled with dread. My once happy family went to depression and not speaking. My marriage started to suffer. It felt like no matter what, we couldn't be happy while inside. We had four dogs, a German Shepherd, a Pit Bull, a Chihuahua, and a Terrier mix. All four dogs followed me wherever I went and made a circle around my feet. If I went to the kitchen, they were there. The dining room, eating, the dogs lay at my feet. Even if I went to the bathroom, the dogs would make a circle around me in the toilet. They stood at my side and refused to move. And then the electrical problem started. We would hear zaps and buzzing coming from the breaker box. Multiple calls to the landlord. She would send someone out to fix it, but that didn't last very long. We had to leave one weekend because the problem was so bad my husband feared we were going to die in an electrical fire. Around Christmas time, our oldest son ran into the bedroom scared and crying because he saw a lady in a nightgown staring at him through the living room window. My husband and I checked the entire property but found no woman or any evidence of her. A few months before my family moved, I started having nightmares. I would dream of setting the house on fire and dying with it, just sitting on the bed while the flames burnt me. I couldn't sleep at night because of them. My husband started having the same thoughts and we both just wanted to die in the house. My father-in-law started having hallucinations. He would scream that the rooms were on fire. He would watch a funeral take place in our front yard when there wasn't one. He would talk to himself and poured bleach in a pot of soup beans that I was cooking. It got so bad I took all the knives and hid them in my purse while myself, my husband, and our four kids slept in one bedroom with the door locked, scared of him. We honestly believed that he was going to kill us. Every passing day, things were getting worse. The ideas of ending my own life grew stronger and finally we couldn't take it. We found a new place to rent and walking away from that house was like a weight lifting. Every step got easier to breathe and I started to smile more. A month after we had moved, my cousin sent me a Facebook message. It was a post from one of the old neighbors. That house was on fire and the picture was taken from the back bedroom. My children's room where the breaker box was. No one set the fire and no one was living in it. I truly believe that house was evil and wanted to burn. Since moving, my dogs no longer surround me. My marriage is improved and my father-in-law no longer has hallucinations. My husband and I met in college. I won't name names for the sake of privacy, but we went to one of our region's oldest colleges, over 200 years old, and it is known to be very haunted. We started dating our freshman year and we pretty much started living together right away. I was a commuter so I would stay over in his dorm often. In our junior year, my husband, boyfriend at the time, Jay, landed a sweet living situation where he was able to have a bedroom to himself in a larger suite with only two guys' suite mates. This was the ideal situation for us because it meant I could basically live with him during the school year since he didn't have a person sharing a bedroom with him. This living situation was obviously incredibly beneficial for me and I loved it. 
Aside from having to share a twin XL bed with a 6 foot 2, 250 pound linebacker, it was pretty awesome. It didn't take me long at all to realize how haunted the building was. I have a ton of stories about my experiences in the building and on the campus in general, but explaining them all in this post will be way too long. I'll discuss a few big ones so that there's a bit of context. Jay was a resident assistant and had a lot of work to prepare the suites for all the other students who would be moving in soon. Because of this, he was able to move in about a week before anybody else. On the day that we were moving Jay's things into the building, I had multiple sightings of a tall black shadowy figure. I would always catch it out of the corner of my eye, and it would quickly dart out of sight every time I did a double take or tried to look at it more closely. I saw this figure probably four to five times on move-in day and didn't think much of it until I remembered that the building was basically empty except for Jay and me. Other experiences included hearing voices, hearing scratching, banging, thumping, at times when it could not be explained. A very creepy night alone on campus during a holiday break when a major storm hit and all of the power went out and more. We had a lot of creepy experiences, but my least favorite part of living in this building was honestly just the feeling I got being there alone. If I was ever alone in any part of the room, I immediately would feel a presence enter the space I was in. It felt intense and loud and scary. The best way I can explain it is that it felt like someone was standing beside me and screaming in my face, but there was no sound. We lived with this weird presence the entire time we were in the building, and we honestly were fine for months. But then something weird started happening. Jay would start waking up in the middle of the night by speaking a different language. I know saying speaking in tongues sounds ridiculous, but I honestly don't know how else to describe it. I swear he sounded like he was speaking a foreign language, but it was a language that I couldn't identify and had never heard before. He always sounded really intense and had an almost aggressive tone to his garbled words, whatever he was saying. He woke me up by talking in his sleep like this every night for months. It creeped me out, but I never said anything about it until one night. It scared me so terribly that I had no other choice. I woke up one night to find Jay on top of me. Remember, we shared a twin XL bed and he's a huge guy. I was on my back and he was straddling me with his palms flat on the bed on either side of my head. His eyes were wide open and he was bent down and staring right into my face. I was immediately spooked but played it off by saying something like, Uh, hi babe, you good? Is everything okay? No response. Jay continued to stare through me and didn't move. I kept this up for a minute or two, thinking he was potentially just being silly or was groggy from sleep and couldn't form his words. We stayed like that for what felt like forever, but what was really like three to four minutes. He then got off of me, climbed over to get out of bed, and stood still in the room for a few seconds. After that, he turned sharply to look at the desk and chair in the bedroom he pulled the chair up from the desk, turned it around 180 degrees so that it was facing him, walked around the chair three times in a circle, and then stood back to face the chair directly. He stood staring at the seat of the chair for about a minute, and then got back into bed with me and went immediately to sleep. The entire time this was happening, I was watching with my mouth wide open. I know that I tried to call to him, get his attention a few times to see what he was doing, but... At a certain point, all I could do was watch in bewilderment. This was the strangest thing that ever happened to me. I told Jay all about it and what he did the next morning, and he was very upset because it scared him so badly. He is not and has never been a sleepwalker or a sleep talker. Shortly after this event, I decided to cleanse the place with some help from a friend. We did and things really quieted down afterward. Jay continued to talk in his sleep every now and again for the rest of that school year, and even here and there for the next school year. We've been married and living in our own place since we graduated almost two years ago, and I haven't heard Jay sleep talk or seen him sleepwalk a single time since we left living on campus. I know that building was haunted, 
and I really believe that whatever it was attached to Jay for some reason and tried to speak through him. I'm 30 now. When I was in my teens and early 20s, I was really into weird stuff. There's a few local shops that sell unusual oddities and antiques, like art made from dead animals, skulls, pickled specimens, things like that. I started pickling my own specimens around age 20 when I figured out it wasn't that hard. I had some articulated skeletons, but stuff I was really interested in was supposedly cursed stuff. I bought things people claimed were cursed on eBay and even drove to different states to buy things from people they claimed were haunted. I bought three different Dybbuk boxes supposedly cursed from eBay. I bought numerous haunted dolls, whatever I could find. I had some weird taxidermy items too, like a couple two-headed baby chickens, a snake with two heads, etc. I had a few things I wasn't supposed to have either, but I won't get into that. Long story short, nothing weird ever happened. Not a thing. I never had one unusual, creepy experience with any of this stuff. I should start this off by saying I've never really believed in the paranormal or supernatural. Like, I wouldn't say I'm a skeptic, because I think to use that term, you have to go into something deciding it isn't real and operate from that perspective. I'm fine with saying I have no idea what this is. I can't explain it. I won't say I don't believe in ghosts because I don't really know what a ghost is supposed to be. I've always been into aliens and was really obsessed with them when I was younger, but still never fully believed in them. I just kind of like the idea of them. I'd never seen one, or seen any real proof of one, despite poring over documentary and late night history channel binges. So on the subject of all things paranormal, you could say I'm a fox molder and I want to believe, but never really did. Needless to say, after the following series of events, my mind is quite a bit more open, though I won't pretend I can tell you exactly what was going on. So I'm like 21 years old and I'm working at a Walmart at the time. We had these steps that we would smoke on that were outside the tire shop that led up to another parking lot for a different building. I went out to smoke one day and was by myself and sat at the top of the stairs. As I was smoking, I noticed a paper bag sitting kind of underneath one of the bushes that was there. I don't know why, but I looked in it. I was expecting to find some empty beer bottles or something, but inside of the bag was a porcelain lamb. It wasn't particularly creepy looking, to be honest. It didn't have bleeding eyes or whatever. It just looked like something that would be on your grandma's shelf. It had a red ribbon around its neck and looked really new. When I picked it up, there was a note underneath it in the bag. The note said, Take me home. I'm a good little girl, I promise. No, really, I know you're already about to stop reading because that sounds incredibly corny, and it does, but that's literally what it said. It was written in red ink and looked like female handwriting. Really neat. It was written on a piece of torn standard notebook paper. Again, I know how stupid and cliche that note sounds, but that's actually what it said. So of course, being me, I brought the thing inside Walmart and stashed it under a register because I was totally going to take that home. I showed it to my friend who was working there and was kind of like, dude, look what I found outside, look at this note. And he was like, "Uh, you should definitely not take that home. But of course I was going to take it home. I live for stuff like this. Anyway, as soon as I set it down, I realized it was a music box. Because I jarred it enough, I guess it made it start playing. I looked at the bottom of it, and it had one of those metal twist pins you wind up, and it plays a tune. So, I turned it, and it was the least intimidating melody ever. It wasn't creepy at all. I was actually getting legit disappointed because if you wanted to pull a prank on someone with some scary object, this thing was doing it all wrong. I don't know what the melody was, I'd never heard it before, but it was in no way ominous. Fast forward to the end of the workday, I get in my car, come home, and show my then girlfriend. She was into all the same weird stuff I was, so she was equally excited about this weird find. 
We cleared a space on our dresser for it, and from then on we just referred to it as the lamb. Things started to go down immediately, like the next day. Me and my ex didn't have a great relationship, and I spent most of my time in the living room. She hung out in the bedroom. I'd work until around 11 at night and get home and stay on my computer playing games until about 3 a.m. Then once she was asleep, I'd go in the bedroom and go to sleep. This way, we didn't really spend that much time together, and we both quietly preferred it that way. So the very next day, I'm sitting in the living room, and I hear a rustling sound coming from the kitchen. I could see the entire kitchen from where my computer was and assumed it was one of our two cats messing with something, but both cats were actually on the floor staring at the kitchen, just as confused as I was. The sound seemed like it was coming from on top of the fridge, and it sounded like something was rustling around the cereal boxes and bags of chips and such that were up there. I assumed it was a mouse because we'd found a mouse in the house before. The first specimen I'd ever pickled myself, actually, and went over to the kitchen to check for a mouse. I turned on the light, and as I walked in the kitchen, I heard the grudge noise. I've only seen the grudge once, because it was one of the only films that ever actually scared me. I'm not easily frightened, and I generally don't care for horror movies, but something about the long, frog, croak sound of the grudge freaked me out when I was younger. And the only similar thing that scared me recently was the screaming bear in Annihilation. I started walking toward the fridge and I'm totally hearing the grudge noise. This is only impactful because this is literally one of the only things I've ever been afraid of and it was coming directly from the top of the fridge where the rustling sound had been. I froze dead in place and so did my cats. They didn't want to go anywhere near there either. I had no idea what to do. I was literally on the verge of passing out so I tried to articulate this in my head and I decided that the fridge must be broken and that a fan or something in it must be grinding. I crammed that thought into my head and sat back down at my chair and put on my headphones. I did leave the light on, I'll admit. Normally I sat in the total dark. In my head I was really trying to convince myself the fridge was making that noise but I was finding it really hard to do. But I also was in panic mode and I was like, what do movies and ghosts shows and stuff say? Don't acknowledge it exists. So I became the dad in every horror film and just said, Fridge is broken, and went back to playing WoW while on the verge of jumping out of my own skin and using my headphones to drown out the noise. I actually sat there for way longer than I normally played WoW because I was genuinely terrified to either move or take my headphones off. I had this horrible thought in my head that as soon as I removed my headphones... I would hear the noise like right next to my ear and turn and some old woman would eat my face or something. I have no idea how long the noise went on or when it stopped. So I literally sat there until sunrise. I never went to sleep and I used an Elvis playlist and chatting to my guildmates and wow to distract me as best as I could. But I literally just sat there frozen in terror the entire night until the sun came up and my girlfriend woke up. She came in the living room at about 8 a.m. and was mad at me because I never went to bed. She complained I play games too much, even though we both knew she didn't want me around any more than I wanted to be around her. But our relationship issues aside, she was badgering me about being on the computer all night and I just said, I don't want to talk about it. And she kind of let it go. She softened up quite a bit, looked a little confused, but I think she could tell I was freaked out. Then she proceeded to freak me out even further. She showed me her arm and said, that the cat scratched me up last night. And she indeed had what appeared to be a cat scratch down the length of her forearm. Problem was, she kept the bedroom door closed and like I said, both of the cats were in the living room with me and I hadn't moved from that chair. No one left the cat in the bathroom. They were in the living room with me the entire night. In fact, when sunrise finally came, they were still almost in the exact same spot, staring at the kitchen, that they had been when I went back to playing WoW. I didn't say anything about it, I just said, Oh, dang. And I felt like I was going to be sick. Since I hadn't slept, I called into work that day, even though in reality I just really wanted to leave. So I did an unusual thing and me and my girlfriend went bowling for the day, 
then to a movie, then dinner. I was clearly acting weird because we never really did anything together and I was clearly trying to avoid the house. I actually asked if she wanted to go night fishing and she finally asked me what was going on. I didn't tell her though. I didn't want to talk about it. She declined my generous offer to fish in the dark and we ended up going home. We started our nightly ritual. She retired to the bedroom to watch TV and I stayed in the living room. The grudge noise started within an hour of me sitting down. This time, as soon as it started, I willed my completely stiff and fear body to get up and walk down the hall to the bedroom. I left my computer running and wow open and said I felt like watching TV. My girlfriend again remarked that I was acting weird and I again declined to talk about it. I couldn't hear the grudge noise from the bedroom. I took some Benadryl and went to sleep when she did, which was hours before I normally went to sleep. The next day I went to work and at around 9pm she called me. I was the manager of the toys department and had a bit of a leeway in using my phone since no one really supervised me. So I answered and she was on the phone freaking out. She was screaming into the phone and I could hear her knocking in the background and couldn't really make out what she was saying. Finally I made out a sentence. She was saying there's banging, someone's trying to get in through the walls. I left work and drove home and stayed on the phone with her the whole time, and at some point on my drive home she left the house and started running down the street. I picked her up in her pajamas as I was driving back and she said someone was trying to break through the walls. She heard banging on all of the walls of the bedroom. By this point I was pretty certain I knew exactly what she was hearing but I still didn't want to say anything about it. I wanted to calm her down and told her that it was squirrels. I said I'd seen some squirrels going into a hole in the side of the wall and was afraid we might have them in our walls. This was entirely made up, but it did actually calm her down. She didn't know squirrels could live in our walls, and I convinced her this was the case, and I told her I'd call an exterminator in the morning and have them come out and check it out. We went back to the house, much to my despair. My squirrel story had calmed her down, but that was short-lived. The way our house was set up, we had a bathroom that was connected to our bedroom, but not by a door, just by the wall. So you had to leave our bedroom, and the bathroom was the next room on the right, so the bathroom wall and our bedroom wall were the same wall. Anyway, we got inside. She went to the bathroom and immediately started screaming again. I came into the bathroom to see what the screaming was about, and it looked like a tiger had been clawing at the bathroom wall, the one that connected to our wall. The wallpaper, who wallpapers a bathroom anyway, was torn off about six feet high and there were large gashes in the drywall beneath it. Reminder, this is all like about four days into having this freaking lamb. At this point, we got in the car and I told her about the grudge noise. Her initial reaction was that we needed to get rid of that lamb, but something told me I couldn't. She wanted to just donate it to a thrift shop or something, but... I had this weird sense of unease about doing it. I felt like we couldn't get rid of it that way. I felt like someone had to know what it was and want to take it from us. I can't explain why I felt that way, I just did. So at this point we did what you would probably not expect and we actually just lived with it. Like this went on every day. We had rules about it. The first rule was to never talk about it in the house. We never even mentioned it. We pretended the lamb didn't exist. It was like that episode of Family Guy where they had a giant octopus living in the house and just no one wanted to talk about it. When we had something to say about it, we would always say, let's go for a drive, and we would know what it meant. The clawing at the bathroom wall was getting deeper all the time. Eventually there was a huge hole in the drywall. It was starting to claw through the drywall that was connected to our bedroom. That was when I really started to freak out. For about a year we lived with everything, we just ignored and pretended it didn't happen. Every night I sat with the grudge noise, things would fly off the shelves, doors would slam, straight up paranormal activity stuff every day. One of the worst ones was one of our pickled specimen jars exploded. It was a bird we'd had for a while and the mason jar exploded on the mantel in the living room. Glass went everywhere and it took hours to find it all. The bird itself also completely exploded, 
sending parts splattering around the living room. And I had a few friends I would tell about it every day when I came into work, like they'd ask for updates on what the lamb had been doing, and I'd tell them whatever freaky story we had from the previous day. It was literally a daily occurrence at this point. But then it got to a point we couldn't ignore anymore. My girlfriend was waking up with bruises and scratches almost every day, to the point it started to look like she was self-harming. She had a lot of piercings and tattoos, so she wasn't too troubled by the pain, but didn't really enjoy having to wash blood out of the sheets every day. When it got too much was when I was sitting in the bathroom browsing my phone, and I heard a female voice say, Hey, come here. So I finished my business and walked in the bedroom and said, Did you call me? And she replied with, I was really hoping that was you. This is about six months in. At this point it started talking, like literally speaking. It had a little girl's voice. I know again that's so cliche and stupid sounding, but it would occasionally speak and we could hear it. We never responded to it. Everything we'd read on the subject told us to never, ever respond. We'd hear it at our door every night, say things like, Hey, can I come in, please? Please let me in. At this point, you probably tune this out and chalk this up to some kind of excessively long, poorly written creepypasta, but I promise you, it isn't. Her whole family knew about it as well. All my friends did. Everyone knew about this thing. When we had friends come over, they'd ask about certain stuff the lamb had destroyed, like, what's up with the bathroom wall, and we'd just respond by shaking our heads, and they got the message. Eventually, no one came to our place anymore. Everyone said it freaked them out to be there, and they were terrified just to walk in. Even her parents stopped coming over. Her mother wouldn't even drive down our street. Still, we ignored it, as best we could. Until one night, I'm sitting on my computer and a voice right up behind me says, Hey. I thought it was my girlfriend, so without turning around, I said, Yeah, what's up? And the voice responded, Nothing. Then I realized it wasn't her voice, and I spun around, and nothing was there. I just broke the cardinal rule, and I talked to it. Grabbed my girlfriend and told her what I did while we drove around in the car. She proceeded to call me an idiot for an hour and asked what we were going to do now. So finally I decided to Google local paranormal investigators. I contacted a local paranormal investigator agency and sent them an email with a more condensed version of everything I've just told you. They responded in a few hours and asked me to send them a picture of the lamb. That was the first time since the day we set it down that I'd ever touched it again. Also, I should note, it didn't collect dust. I put it in the middle of the kitchen table, grabbed my camera, and took some pictures of it. I sent the pics away in an email and nothing. Until this point, these people had been responding to me in a matter of hours, and now suddenly a day had gone by. Then two days. In those two days, everything had escalated tenfold. The house was never quiet now. The grudge noise could be heard outside of the house and it never stopped. Half the electronics didn't work. The TV barely worked, it would flicker on and off. The power would go on and off. The taps would start running and then close. The garbage disposal would turn on. The doors were slamming and opening non-stop. It was completely out of control and we couldn't stay in the house anymore. Mind you, I wasn't rich. I'm living on a Walmart salary here, but... We got a hotel room. I brought a laptop and I emailed the paranormal investigators again. They replied to me this time and told me the lady who answers the emails was also there like medium or whatever and that's when I sent her the pictures. She locked herself in her house and had refused to come out for the past two days. They told me they were very sorry and whatever I had was out of their league. So, great, right? My house is possessed and now it's gone insane because I talked to it, and the paranormal investigators don't even want to mess with it. I contemplated calling a priest or something, but I'm not religious, and I didn't know if I would have to have faith in the Lord Jesus or whatever for it to work. 
I contacted another paranormal investigator's company in the area and sent them the same pics and basically begged them for help. This time they actually responded and were helpful and they drove down from about two hours away to help us. When they showed up at our house, nothing was happening. It was quiet and everything looked normal. The doors were all closed, no sounds, nothing. Worse yet, they busted out all these gadgets that I'm not going to pretend I knew what they did or what they were for. Some had lights, some made beeps, some buzzed. One made little lasers all over the house. They had recorders, microphone equipment. They saged the house, walked around waggling electronics at various locations. I don't know exactly what they were doing, but I at least appreciated that they seemed to be trying. They weren't getting anything, though. Nothing was happening. I even recorded bits of it on my camera. Then, all of a sudden, stuff did happen. My camera quit working out of nowhere. The battery just KO'd. All their noisy equipment started making noise and something was over 9,000. There were three people and they started talking to it like, If you're here, give me a sign. And then they asked it to knock on stuff. And this all went on for like two hours. Eventually they wrapped up and the woman who was with them said that she believed the thing inhabiting our lamb wasn't a spirit. She said it wasn't even a person and it was something else. She said it was pretending to be a little girl to try and trick us, and the fact that we weren't being tricked was angering it. They left and told me that she'd call me the next day. She said that she knew someone who might be willing to take it. I couldn't fathom who would want this thing, but my girlfriend and I spent the night in the hotel again, and I did indeed get a call from the woman the next day. She said that she had spoken with someone named John Zaffis and that he was excited and wanted the item. I didn't know who that was at the time. She told me that he was the haunted collector, but that meant nothing to me. They said he had a paranormal museum. They came back to the house, got the lamb, and mailed the thing off to him. Later, I realized that the dude had a TV show and was the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And that's basically the end. Once this Zaphis dude had agreed to take it, everything had stopped. We never had another weird incident again. I never fixed the bathroom wall, though. We moved out when we split up and left it like that for the people we sold the house to. So on a side note, I recently, in the last six months, watched The Conjuring movies. In the very short scene in, I believe, The Conjuring 2, there's a shot of the Warren's daughter sleeping in her bed. On her nightstand is an identical lamb to the one that I had. When I saw it, I almost started crying in horror. Though the one in the film has a blue bow around its neck, and the one I had I'm pretty sure was red, the one in the film also doesn't appear to be a music box. Before anyone asks, yes, I do actually still have the picture of it that I sent to the original paranormal team. I will post them here, but I'd rather not touch the memory card that contains it. I'm originally from a town called San Juan Caspastrano. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with it or currently live there. Anyway, I attended Marco Forster Middle School. I remember we all went to the auditorium because we were having a guest speaker talk about a book he was coming out with soon. The book had to do with a kid that got abducted by aliens and how he was able to control the crafts and travel in the alien ship's computer system. I remember him telling us about his own experience. He looked at us all as his eyes shone with excitement. He went on to tell us how when he was a young boy, he was out playing by a big log with his younger brother. At the time, he had been living by a forest. He told us about how they went along playing till this bully showed up. Forgive me, I can't remember the exact details as this happened 12 years ago, but I remember him telling us how the bully pushed him and he fell off of the log. And when he turned to get himself up, he spotted something under the log that he had been playing on. He said he was so shocked and confused from what he was seeing that even the bully and his younger brother went to take a look, and what they saw was a large, light brown, almost wood-looking, deceased humanoid figure. 
He explained how it had long, skinny arms and fingers, and how it wore what seemed like a long, darkish purple cloak with metallic engravings. His bully, who was petrified with fear, started to cry. Our speaker went on to say how he took a piece of it and headed back home with his younger brother. He told us he had stored it in a jar, knowing what he had found was otherworldly. A few days later, he went back again to the same spot, but the figure was gone. He then told us after he had graduated school, he moved away and took the jar with him. He had decided to send a piece of the clothing to get tested because he was unsure if what he had seen was real. He said that he had gotten a letter saying that he had to submit everything he had, where he replied that that was it, of which he lied, of course. He told us that that confirmed that what he had seen as a kid was real. He hid his jar under the floorboards, knowing that the people he sent a sample to probably weren't going to believe him, and he really didn't want them to take away the only proof he had of them, of what was possibly extraterrestrial. A few days later, he had come home from work to his house being trashed. Not trashed as if though someone was trying to rob him, but as if someone was looking for something. He immediately checked under his floorboards and saw his jar was still there with the object inside. As he finished his story, he told us all to line up as he reached into a black bag that he had on stage. With a smile, he pulled out a large jar. Of course, I could have told the kids I was terrified of aliens, but I didn't want to be called any names or taunted. I remember walking up to him and looking in the jar and seeing the old purple material he described with metallic symbols. Now trust me when I say I got a chill. Sitting under the purple material was what seemed to be an extremely skinny hand. It seemed almost like wrinkly wood. It looked preserved. We were so amazed even the teachers went to take a look. Before he ended his visit, he told us once again the name of his book and his own name. I even wrote the name down in my notebook and waited for it to come out, but it seemed like it never did. In high school, I Google searched his book, but nothing came up. I googled his name and nothing came. I found it strange since his book was supposed to come out the month after his visit to my middle school. He even had sequels ready and showed us the book covers. After I graduated high school, I again google searched it and nothing was there from him. I got a nasty feeling that maybe someone at my school said something and reported him because there's nothing on him. And it bothers me to this day because I remember him telling us that we can look online to see where we can find his book, and I truly hope that he's okay. I'm nearly 20 and I'm still not a fan of the dark. When I was little, following behind my dad as he went to turn on the lights for me, he'd always say the same thing. You're not afraid of the dark, you're afraid of what's in it. I think it was supposed to be reassuring, and although I don't remember much of my childhood, I remember the trouble my sister would get in for even suggesting anything horror-related. I'd be up every night having my parents check every crevice in my room, pouting out to the living room sobbing about the shadowy figures standing over me. Of course, when you're older, you learn to accept that those images were probably your mind playing tricks on you, trying to make sense of the formless space around you. Well, Jobin showed up about a year ago. He didn't say that was his name, but I hoped calling him something goofy would make him seem less frightening. I wouldn't say it worked, but it makes things more convenient. Jobin is almost seven feet tall. His body is impossibly thin and from what I can tell, he consists only of shadows. His fingers resemble elongated sewing needles. He wraps one hand around the corner when he peers at me. I think once I've seen him try to wrap those needle fingers to cover my eyes. He even has eyes like a cat in the dark, just like a slight gleam to tip you off that he's there and watching you. Jobin doesn't necessarily restrict himself to when you're alone or when it's dark, He'll pop up any time, anywhere. Although I've never heard him speak, he is occasionally accompanied by voices that are simultaneously a scream in your ears and barely audible. Sometimes I would quietly hear someone calling my name from the closet in my room or just around my shoulder, 
progressively getting louder as I whipped my head around to find the source. For three months straight, I had my father check inside my closet because I was convinced someone had been living in there, watching and calling me. Professionals tell me these are simple hallucinations, that with enough medication and treatment they'll go away. Jobin is persistent. I occasionally try to ignore him, but then conveniently imaginary bugs will crawl across the wall in the corner of my eye and force me to turn my head. If I'm lucky, he's usually around a corner across the room or standing flat against the wall. The worst nights are when I wake startled in bed and turn to see him taking slow, staggering steps further into the room. Usually he stops moving once I see him and never gets too close. I force down some sleeping pills and repeatedly try to rationalize the delusion. However, last night his elongated body stood over my bed, small gleaming pupils locked to me before he crept back away. I'm afraid of what he'll try tonight. I was contacted by an old friend recently. It was a very surprising call as he contacted me to do a house clearing and blessing for him. This guy is a tough nut, not easily scared. He listed off the crazy events that led to him contacting me. Lots of unexplained electrical problems, strange noises, animals acting freaked out. The list goes on. As we spoke, I started to get impressions about the situation and asked him of the home's history. Interestingly enough, the original homestead had burnt down and the existing dwelling was moved from another property. He had recently dug down to expand the crawl space into a functional height basement and discovered an old burnt brick foundation. I went and cleared the home. I also acknowledged the spirits in the basement, but also told them they couldn't stay. I always ask for kids and dogs to not be in the home when I work as they get underfoot and distract me. As I sent the spirits out the door, both his dogs just froze in the porch and their gaze followed whatever they were seeing upwards. I'm happy to say it's been a few weeks and he has had no problems since all activity ceased. I sense that a couple and one child died in the fire. He is trying to research it and I'm looking forward to what he finds out. Seems often when we disturb things that have been at rest a long time, it can trigger activity. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.